Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Yeah, the size back. I did a um, Q&A for the Supporters Trust um, in midweek on Wednesday night and very lots of very nice people came up to me, had a little chat and the overriding theme seemed to be thank goodness we don't have to hear the sigh this season. Um, it has been rare. It hasn't been there a lot. There's been the odd game, the odd defeat where it's been there. It's kind of returned for last night. Last night was not great at all. Um, look, there's some mitigating factors that we'll talk about and we can discuss probably at length, um, although I've got quite a strong opinion on it, on the goal that Man City scored. So apologies if I'm going to offend anyone who's kind of set their mind on that. Um... But yeah, the size back, it's just, uh, it was such a mere game. And it was one of those where I sat in the um, press area ahead of the game. And it just, it always worries me without fail when there's an overriding sense of confidence in Tottenham. It just does. And, and I mean, among the media, and actually among some fans as well. I think just being a Spurs fan since birth, since emerging into the world of Tottenham Hotspur as a newborn baby, it has been bred into me, or just maybe my DNA, to always fear the worst with Spurs. So whenever I start to hear people saying, oh, you know what, I'm quite confident Spurs are going to get something out of tonight's game, I think instantly every part of my body is saying, no, 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 they won't. Um, if you're going to say that, they won't. And so it was... I just, you know, there was a bit of an irony towards the fact um, that Spurs, I've been posted to Cogley, gave the Spurs players four days off last week. Um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the previous week, which actually, when we kind of worked it out, um, it was George and I, George Sessions from PA and I, we kind of worked it out. Actually, by the time they came back, I mean, they would have done some pre kind of week, uh, pre preparation the week before, but ultimately, it did kind of mean that they only really had Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday to really prepare for the City game. Thursday you would have been doing kind of a lighter tactical session, obviously, because it's day ahead of the game. But uh, look, I'm no expert. If, if that's seen as more than enough time to prepare, prepare for the game, then it's more than enough, more than enough time. I, I don't know that much about football training sessions and preparations and all that sort of stuff uh, to really criticise that. But I just was surprised when I worked out in my head, it was like, oh, couldn't you have done those four days earlier? But it's nothing to do with me. And it's one of those things where, you know, had they got away with a win, no one would even kind of bring that into question. It was more the fact, the reason I bring up those four days off was that you would imagine, oh, you know, after all of those games when Spurs dug deep into their energy reserves somehow, despite the fact they had so many players out, players playing every single game pretty much, yet they would dig that energy and stamina out from somewhere. Um, it felt like they'd had a rest, and actually they looked more flat and knackered than they had in, you know, any of the games before that when they hadn't had a rest. I was just really disappointed with the performance, and you could tell Postacoglu was as well. He was very kind of flat and down in the press conference. I'd heard some of the people who had done the kind of TV and radio interviews had, had warned me like, oh, you know, you're not going to get much from him in the press conference. I think it kind of warmed up as the press conference went on. I think he started to talk himself into a slightly better mood as he kind of uh, explained it all. But what I would say is I think he saw, I'm not going to say that, you know, me and Anja, you know, like kind, uh, like spirits or kindred spirits, like minds, kindred spirits. I knew there were two different expressions I was mangling together there. I'm not saying we are exactly that, but I do think we probably both took the same thing from the game. That regardless of what you want to say about the good defending, the fact that, you know, it was only 1-0, only if that's a good thing to kind of hang your hat on, it just wasn't the Postacoglu Tottenham. It wasn't. Um, I've seen it a couple of times this season. I saw it at Wolves, um, and I feel like there was another game as well that's gone out of my head that I'm forgetting, but mainly Wolves is the one that always sticks in my mind. Um, but yeah, last night, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium just felt like they'd forgotten a lot of the good things that had been taught by him, and most importantly, the fear had returned. That's something he's eradicated from a lot of um, uh, what... Spurs have done this season yet yeah kind of felt like there was a lot of too much respect for City 
And this is a team, yeah, look, they're one of the best teams, if not the best team in the world. Um, they're the Premier League champions. They're the holders of the FA Cup that Spurs are playing in the competition. Um, and they have, you know, been incredibly assembled over the last, whatever it is, eight, nine years, uh, eight years, I think it was, was it 2016, I think he came along. Um, Jurgen Klopp, uh, oh, Jurgen Klopp, we'll talk about him in a bit, it's not him, Pep Guardiola is who I mean. <sighs> Yet, this is a team that has struggled to... Uh, haven't won at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium until last night. Haven't scored at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium until last night. So I don't think Spurs... And, and to be honest, they you know Spurs, the 3-3 at Etihad uh, Stadium early in the season, had been superb in terms of the second half and, and showing that, that belief in themselves, that conviction, that lack of fear. Yeah, first half, they could have been blown away and you know things had gone slightly differently. But second half, they showed a lot of what I think Postacoglu wanted to see last night. And, then, and you know, the noise when the game started was incredible at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It was just, oh, it was deafening. It was brilliant. And then it just kind of all went a bit like, Ugh. it just really was such a meh game. Um, and look, he did. He pointed that out afterwards, and we'll talk about that in a bit, about the fact that, yeah, this uh, Guardiola team has been eight years or so in the making, Whereas, you know, Spurs are six months old, the Postacoglu Spurs. Um, and I get that. But it just felt like they were very timid and passive and like, oh, don't hurt us. Oh, please don't hurt us. And that's just not the Postacoglu Spurs. They've been so brave in so much of what they've done this season. I mean, I've got the stats here. 57% of the possessions City had. They played 528 passes to Spurs, 385. That's the kind of reverse of the numbers that we've seen from Spurs. Spurs normally the ones leading the possession and uh, leading the passes by a long shot. I feel like at the Etihad they had more of the possession as well, Spurs. I think, unless I'm mistaken. I could be wrong, but I feel like they did. Certainly they went to Old Trafford, obviously, a couple of weeks back and, and bossed the possession there. Um, it's the shots at goal, which is the biggest indicator for me, though. Man City had 18 shots at goal, five on target. Spurs managed one shot on goal, one at home. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the first game that Spurs have not scored a goal in under Postacoglu. Pretty sure that is. Yeah, I can't think of any other game. Um, and that was why it was so disappointing. Look, we can talk about the opposition. They, they were in. They're an incredible team. They've got so many players. I mean, their subs bench was like a starting eleven for like a top six Premier League team, if not higher. Um, it was a ridiculous subs bench when I saw it. Um, look, and Spurs defended well. I don't think. I make sure, please, do not think that I'm doing down the performances of some of the players because Spurs defended very well. They did. Um, Vicari only had four saves to make in the whole game. Two of them really the only tough ones he had to make. Um, and that's testament to, I think, the way they defended. Um, but they scraped that goal. Uh, they did. I say scraped it. They deserved it. Don't get me wrong. But they did scrape it um, in terms of it was a scuffed goal. Um, obviously, Vicario under pressure. Some will say it's a foul, but we'll have a bit of a deeper conversation about that. Um, punching it down into the back of Van der Ven. Van der Ven is like, what? what's just happened? The ball bounced around. Nathan Ake touches it home in a yeah very scrappy goal. And it's funny that all of their attacking quality, that's the first goal they score um, uh, at the Spurs stadium. It's the first goal of what I've written down here. The first goal away against Spurs for City in five years, two months and 29 days since Riyad Mahrez scored at Wembley in 2018. And since um, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium opened, the City have played there. They've had more than 100 shots at goal before scoring that one. Um, incredible. Um, and look, we can, you know, some people out there I've seen have been praising Spurs for uh, keeping City out for that long. It was the 88th minute. What I would say is, were those same people praising Ryan Mason's team in the Carabao Cup final um, 2021 for... For doing the same, um, because, I mean, when are they, I think Laporte scored in the 82nd minute in that game, uh, yet no one really came away from that game thinking, oh, well done, plucky old Spurs, just lost it at the end. I think everyone, kind of similar feelings, yes, it was a bit like, 
uh, he didn't really go for it. <laughs> it was like a really disappointing kind of performance. So, yeah, I don't know if we can kind of feel like way, that way after a cup final. Yes, I know it's a cup final, so maybe slightly different, but this is still a cup game. And then, like, lavish praise on, on Spurs for defending because a backs-to-the-wall defensive performance is not really what we want from Spurs nowadays. They're more than that. Um, so, yeah. And it was another defender, wasn't it? Yeah, Laporte. And then uh, Ake scored this one. Strange the way the world works. But, uh, hey, I don't want a trophy anyway. It's just something else to polish. It's been a long time. Unless something remarkable happens in the rest of uh, this season, which I mean, it would have to be truly remarkable. 2024, you're going to chalk up as another year when Spurs did not win a trophy. Um, was it 2008 last one, so that will be 17 years by the time the next chance in 2025 comes around to win trophies. Oh, that's a long time. Oh my goodness. You know, there's there's young Spurs fans out there, increasing numbers of them who have never seen Spurs win a trophy. That's uh, that's a scary thought. Um, so yeah, I mean, Postecoglou certainly wasn't having it that they were, you know, a, you know, a plucky bunch Tottenham or anything like that. He was not uh, happy with that. And yes, you know, City are all grown up under Guardiola. Spurs are a newborn baby in relative terms under Postecoglou. Um, it's a minimum requirement for the Spurs team to to go forward, try, create, take risks, um, you know, put themselves on the line to to try and play the lovely football that Postecoglou wants them to play. So, yeah, this uh, especially on the home turf as well, it was just missing everything really. That the apart from the defending, that, that, I'm not going to say everything. That's that's not fair. It was missing everything going forward that we've come to expect from Postacoglu's teams. Um, I asked him after the game, I said, you know, it was so flat going forward. I said, was that because of the quality of opposition or was that just because the team struggled to get going with the things you wanted them to do? Uh, he said, I think it was a little bit of both. They're a top team. They're the benchmark. We're not the, there yet. and We're under no illusion about that. I just felt that all of the second half was okay. The first, uh, sorry, the second half was okay, but the first half we were just too passive in a lot of our play and allowed them to get a rhythm in their game. It's not what you want against them. It's very hard to arrest that mid-game. I thought we started the second half better with a bit more conviction about our play, but ultimately we were just working hard to stay in the game, and that wasn't going to be enough tonight. Um, he said it was just about having more belief and conviction in ourselves in that first 45 minutes. You know once they get into a bit of rhythm, then like I said, it's very hard to wrestle that back off them. I thought we did that, as in have belief in the second half. The first 15 to 20 minutes, we created a couple of good moments for ourselves, and I thought we defended well. It's not like Vic had a million saves to make or that they created a lot against us, so it's disappointing to concede so late. But having said that, it's not what we're about. We worked hard enough, but it seemed like we were just working to the maximum to stay in the game rather than getting over the top of them. And that's it. That's it uh, pretty much. It, this was this was Tottenham Hotspur, but as we used to know it, this was not the version that Ange Postacoglu had created. Um, and that was what, yeah, that was what really kind of disappointed me. I was walking back to the train at Northumberland Park and I was just trying to think like, how do I dive into this? How do I tackle this? How do I write about it? Because um, it just really felt like a lot of the elements were missing in what we've seen um, from Spurs. And uh, yeah, we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to the uh, to the Tottenham past. Well, recent past anyway. Uh, it'd be nice if I could go back to, you know, early 60s would do okay. Um, but yeah, this was uh, just so blur. Um, yeah, which was such a shame. And I think you could see it on the players' faces as well. See them as they were coming off. I was watching some of their interviews afterwards as well. And I'm really hopeful there's going to be a big reaction against Brentford because I think they'll know that that just was an F and it wasn't good enough. Um, and I've seen some people defending it on social media and that, that's that's great, you know, see kind of supporters' support. That's fantastic. Um, but I do think there's uh, a lot, you know... Uh, 
standards have been set higher this season. I think that's probably the best way to put it. And, uh, you know, and Spurs also have beaten City a fair bit in the past. And look, there was uh, there was one player missing uh, who I think was, was crucial. Um, there's no getting around that. And that is Sonny, Son Hoon Min. Obviously has been a player who's terrified City over recent years. Um, and of course, he was thousands of miles away at the Asian Cup in Qatar. Um, I would imagine City seeing the team line up and seeing... Well, they would have known he wasn't going to be on there, so it wasn't a shock. But just seeing a team sheet without his name on it probably made them breathe that little bit easier. Not just have to worry too much, because Sonny's had 12 goal involvements in 17 appearances against them in the Premier League and Champions League. Eight goals and four assists. And just every time he runs at them, their eyes are like, oh my God, what's he going to do? Um, and, you know, Kyle Walker, who I thought was excellent yesterday, that just... I don't know whether I find that more annoying or impressive that Kyle Walker, at, what, 33 years old, is still a superb player. He's still got his pace. Um, and Werner, you know, we'll talk about Timo Werner in a moment, but having Sonny... Sonny just terrifies Walker. He doesn't know what to do when he's coming up against him. Um, and... Yeah, yeah, he just didn't have that same fear factor, Timo Werner. He had some good points to his game, he had some not so good points. Um, but just missing Sonny, it just felt like this big void in the team. Look, in an ideal world, I think you would have hoped the void would have been filled by James Madison. Obviously, James Madison, if you're not aware, back in training for the last week and a half or so, um, and back in the squad on the bench, though, rather than. Um, the starting lineup, and I think there was. I certainly would have. This is pre-game. Would have liked to have seen him start in terms of getting the lift that Spurs had when Bentancur was suddenly in the starting lineup against Bournemouth. You could just feel like this kind of electricity around the place, and, and the players and the fans all really lifted. And I wondered whether that would similar would happen if Madison was in the team yesterday. However, I revised that later on, having seen him come on for the last twenty minutes or so. He touched the ball just six times. And Postacoglu, what he said before the match was spot on. I think I've got a quote later on in the, you know, just it was too ferocious and high intensity a game uh, to throw Madison back in after almost three months out, two and a half months or so. Um, and yeah, watching him in those last 20 minutes, even when City were kind of not at the full kind of top gear anymore, he just was barely involved. You could kind of tell. And yeah, I, I didn't have as much of a kind of a concern about that decision after the match as I did before it. And, and it's another example, of course, of the manager knowing better, you know, having seen the player in training and knowing where he's at exactly and how sharp he is and, and understanding better than we can from the outside. As, as much as we'd like to think we're all quite literally, I was, was going to say armchair managers, sofa managers. Um, but yeah, six times. You want you want to play like Madders, touching that ball a hell of a lot more than six times. Um, I just felt like the Spurs attack that they had out there failed to play to their strengths. So you had Johnson, you had Werner. We know that their key kind of strengths are, are pace. They're both ridiculously fast players. I mean, uh, Brennan Johnson, the game at the Etihad, he absolutely tore Walker apart for pace in those final moments to cross it for Kudusevsky to score the equaliser. Um, neither of them use their pace properly yesterday um i still feel like with johnson that's something that he's got to really work on with his confidence Werner, perhaps it's more yeah maybe it's a confidence thing as well after you know his previous time um in the premier league and this season hasn't gone too well for him at leipzig maybe there's an element of that i think if both of them had gone at their defenders flying at them um with pace with a direct threat you probably would have seen a different game and it would have unlocked Richarlison a bit more. But neither of them really did it. They both kept kind of getting the ball, turning inside and playing a simple pass. Um, to be fair to Werner especially, he there were quite a few times when I could see he was trying to make a run and, you know, for differing reasons, the midfield were just not reading it very well. Um, and look, the one time they did actually combine... Um, Werner played the ball in front of um, Johnson, ran through, and it kind of, the only thing I would say, that I felt the pass was a little bit too far ahead of him. Um, by the time he'd got there, Ortega, City goalkeeper, had come out enough that he could kind of only 
touch it almost into his chest. Um, whereas had he just had that split second more, he could have dinked it over the keeper, like the Maidstone player did um, superbly today against Ipswich. Um, but yeah, it wasn't perfect. It was the only shot Spurs had on goal. Um, so we must cherish it, like the wonderful thing it is. Um, no, we shouldn't. We really shouldn't. Um, like I say, Werner could be forgiven, I think, for not really knowing the system yet. Um, he's got to really kind of get to grips with that. He'll train with the, in the system far more. Um, and like I say, he did try to make runs that just weren't seen. Um, he will be dangerous. I do believe that with Werner. It's, it's just a case of getting sharper as well, um, getting fitter too. He kind of became less and less of a threat as the game wore on. Johnson, it's about confidence. Um, it is with him right now. He's, yeah, he's just not going 100% into things that he normally would or he would have done when he first joined or even when he was at Forest. Um, he had one lovely turn in the second half. He got the ball down the right-hand side and just turned inside a couple of players and then drifted inside. And I think he kind of ended up giving it to someone else to have an effort which didn't kind of come to pass, whereas maybe... Had he had the courage of his convictions and just kept on going into the box, maybe he would have kind of engineered something. But, um, yeah, he it's not quite clicking for him at the moment. It's definitely not there. Like I said, I'm not going to give up on him or declare that he's the worst signing Spurs have ever made or any stuff like that. He just is a little bit out of form and confidence right now. He just almost needs something to kickstart it. It could be a goal. It could be a lovely cross. It could be anything. Um, and I do wonder whether there's this feeling maybe with him and Werner that when um, everyone's fit, they're probably not in that starting eleven. Um, you would imagine uh, it's Sonny Richarlison and Kulusevski. Um, if everyone is fit and firing and on full form, that is. Uh, so maybe he's... I don't know. I was going to say trying too hard, but I, I don't feel like he is. I think more there's the worry about the hamstring and and the lack of confidence. Um, but I'm sure he'll come good. I, I, I am. I, I, I don't really have any doubts about him in that respect, actually. I just think there's so much natural ability there to work with. And he's an incredibly hard worker that I, yeah, I don't worry about him at all. And, and if anything, in a weird way, if he and Werner do re, um, go back to, not go back, but become bench options for some games... They're going to relish coming up against tired defences with their pace. They're going to contribute a lot that way and probably earn themselves then spots back in the first team, um, in the starting eleven. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And I did feel that because both of them were so kind of lacking in a direct threat, that had a knock-on effect with Richarlison. Richarlison worked hard, as he always does, um, but just... Meh. I think he only had, yeah, 28 touches of the ball I've written down here. Only Johnson had less, 22 of all the starting players, in um, the 22 starting players across the pitch. Um, yeah, it's not enough. And Kulisevsky was probably almost more disappointing for me uh, because I think I've come to expect so much of him, and especially in that um, deeper role. He's been very good in it. He... On the left of that three, it was a funny role. He was at times he was on the left of a three. Other times, Ben Takuna Hoibio was sitting behind him, and he was like a number ten. But just when we've seen him in that role before, he's played lovely kind of through balls, really good stuff. Um, but yeah, just didn't really get involved in that capacity yesterday. He was doing some dribbles, trying to make things happen but didn't play the playmaker role. And that's what he needs to do if he's going to be in that role, in that position. I mean, his pass success rate was, uh, he didn't manage a single key pass and only 67.7% of his 31 attempted passes found their target. Um, of all 22 starting players on the pitch, the only person that was worse than that was Pedro Porro, who was 61.8%. And there's a certain irony, I guess, there that those are the two players that Spurs needed the most to be creative. They're the ones that probably, with Madison out and Lo Celso out, <clears throat> are the two players that can play those beautiful through balls or crosses into the box. Porro's set pieces were really poor. Porro's set pieces are normally one of the best uh, things around, you can see, in terms of set pieces. But, 
yeah, didn't contribute enough, the two of them. Uh, and when you've got your two most creative players on the pitch, probably both struggling to get the ball to anyone else in a white shirt, it doesn't bode well. It doesn't. Um, and what I didn't think happened either was that Bentacor was really kind of lacking sharpness. Um, and look, it's understandable. Look, the guy has played, you know, relatively a handful of games in the last year or so um, because of how much time he's missed with the cruciate ligament injury and then the ankle injury. But, yeah, I think I've seen him look sharper in some of the previous games than he did yesterday. He just was off the ball, boil a little bit. Um, he's still probably one of Spurs' best players in coming back, getting the ball, spinning it out quickly wide to the sides. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't working for him yesterday. His um, pass success rate as well. Bear in mind, he's got a passing radar that's usually spot on. 72.7% pass success rate. Um, defensively, he was okay. One tackle, one interception, three clearances, and he blocked two City shots. But you need Benton Kerr as that driving force taking up the pitch. And it just, he wasn't there. He was almost, it went into his shell a little bit with the City pressing. Look, City pressed superbly. Um, they pressed man to man um, all around the pitch and didn't really give Spurs a moment to breathe. The, the, the tactics were very clear. Um, but you need someone like Bentacor, who's normally so comfortable playing within a press or, or against a press, um, that, yeah, he, he kind of went into his shell a little bit. And I didn't like the fact that he wasn't so much the number six. It was Hoybier. We, we've spoken about this before, so apologies for repeating myself, but I don't like Hoybier in the number six role and Benzico not in it. I think when Basuma returns, Benzico in the number eight is going to be brilliant. But I don't like Hoybier in the number six role. And that's not to really have a go at Hoybier, who I do think has got a lot of good abilities to his game and, and, and strengths. But in the number six role, as I've said so many times, that player has to come back, collect the ball off the goalkeeper and spin it out to the fullbacks or a, or a winger or another midfielder. And if that's going to be Hoybier, he needs to be there. He needs to be present. He needs to be constantly coming back to do that. Um, and yeah, especially first half, there were a few moments when he was just not quite showing for that ball, um, and that was creating big problems because the full uh, the centre backs were then wide and getting really pinned in. And there was a moment when Vicario got the ball, and he had no one to pass to, and that is not the Postecoglou system. There's always someone being brave, looking for the quick pass, um, and no one was there. And he had to kind of deliberately boot it out of play to the side, and he went mad. You know, I know he got the nickname in Italy. I think it was um, some broadcasters called him Venom because that he would get so angry on the pitch at things that you know his teammates did or whoever. He would give a verbal volley to them, um, and and he likes that nickname because you know, obviously a very cool character in the kind of Spider Verse. Um, but I haven't really seen him probably get as angry as I did yesterday. I think he had a bit of a go at Cess after the was it the end of the Burnley game and I've seen him do another early on I can't remember who that was at but this one was probably the angriest I've seen him he went mad at everyone in front of him it may well have been to Hoybier but I don't want to pin it on Hoybier if it wasn't um, like I say he wasn't showing for some passes but whether in that moment it wasn't I don't know but he was going crazy and essentially doing that with his hands if to say come back come and get the ball Stop being a bunch of babies, essentially, and come and take it. This is not our way. Um, and funnily enough, there was a little break in play, about four or five minutes towards the end of the half, the first half, when Scott Ledger, one of the um, fourth, uh, not fourth officials, one of the, we used to call them linesmen, we have to call them uh, just uh, assistant referees, that's the term, isn't it, nowadays. He was having some kind of issues with his communication pack, which allows him to talk to all the other um referees and I think back to Stockley Park in the VAR I think they're mic'd up as well as a referee to them um it stopped working so they couldn't continue the game for a while and during that four or five minutes or so um all the players were kind of trying to keep themselves warm some were coming over for water Hoybier came over for some kind of drink I said water I don't know why I said water I'm sure it wasn't just water um, and as he came over Postacoglu made a bit of a beeline for him went over to him and he said something and again he was doing this kind of with his hands, if to say that. And I'm presuming, 
not putting words in the Australian's mouth, um, but I presumably he was saying, you know, go like yourself, come back, collect the ball, and and also get others to do it because in doing so, you're dragging the city players with you, and lo and behold, there's space behind. That's the weakness of the press. The strength of the press is, you know, it causes all kinds of problems for the opposition, but the weakness of it is if they can get around you, bang, suddenly you've left a big gap in behind you to run into. Um, and he was just, I think, trying to get that across. And Hoybier was nodding away, you know, wasn't kind of moaning or anything. He was absolutely kind of very intently listening and taking it all on board. And I would actually say 15, 20 minutes or so after that, going into the second half, Hoybier was excellent. It's really weird because started the game poorly, had a couple of errors straight after that really good period. But in that middle chunk, he was maybe the best player on the pitch during that time. Van der Ven was brilliant. But during that little period, Hoybier was excellent. It's just unfortunately, he bookended it with like some poor moments. Um, I mean, the first kind of that happened was an air kick in his own box. I remember that second half. And that presented the ball to Silva, who had a shot then he just played this needless pass under pressure and it was backwards it wasn't like it was a brave kind of pass that they, like Boscovi wants him to do it was a, it was a pass almost kind of across and back I can't remember if it was to Romero or Porro it was that side of the um the Spurs box it just gave the ball away and were, he was so lucky that the ball got worked back to De Bruyne who just smashed it wide of the left-hand post from about eight yards he was very very lucky it was two really kind of awful moments within the space of about two minutes. Um, and it was a shame because it undid a lot of the good work he'd done before that and, and his link-up play and his trying to uh, play one-twos with people, little triangles to get the ball moving. Um, yeah, wasn't wasn't good overall at all. Neither Hoybier for me or Bentenker overall did enough to kind of really, um, you know, what they had to do in a game against a team like Man City. You've got to be on your kind of highest level when you're playing a team that ridiculously good. Do you know what? <laughs> Probably the best midfielder on the day was Oliver Skip. And he only came on for 20 minutes. Um, it was a really nice little cameo. Look, I know the people that have got it in for Oliver Skip are not going to are going to hear that going, oh, he's Oliver Skip loving again. Oh, there's a laminated membership card, all this sort of stuff. But I generally thought he came on and did really well because he came on and played how Postacoglu wanted him to play. He showed no fear. The irony was he came on the pitch with Madison and he could hear the cheer and noise about Madison. Everyone was so excited. And actually, within the first 30 seconds or so of coming on, uh, Skippy had intercepted a pass in the Spurs half, burst up the pitch, played a really lovely ball uh, into the path of Madison, who then got tackled and lost it. Um, and he had a couple of other nice moments, a couple of nice runs down the right. He had one lovely turn on the edge of his own box when he um, he had no one to pass to. And he just dragged the ball, a bit of a Cruyff turn, span around. Two City players sent it in completely the wrong direction. And you could just tell the crowd in the stadium were like, look at him, that was really cool. Um, and that's what I mean. This is why when people really do him down and say he doesn't have technique or quality or whatever, he does. I just still feel like... and this. It's a big call, but I'm going to say it. I think Spurs would have been a hell of a lot better yesterday if Oliver Skip was starting in that number six role. Um, I know I'm kind of contra uh, contradicting what I said earlier about Benton Gurr being at number six if Hoybier is playing. But technically, if you've got Skip playing, I would like to see Skip in the number six role and then Benton Kerr and Kulusevsky. That's how I would have wanted to see it. Because I do think that Skibby doesn't panic so much under pressure. I've seen people say he does, but I don't actually think he does. I think he panics a hell of a lot less than uh, Hoybier does. I think he's got a little bit better radar of where he knows players are going to be. Yeah, he's going to pass the ball to the opposition sometimes. Every midfielder that plays in a number six role for Spurs is going to do that at some point because of the frequency of, of kind of having to play that ball and also being pressed so relentlessly by the opposition. Um... But yeah, I thought he came on and did really well. It was nice. He's only 23 years old as well. Um, he did well. And actually, I forgot to say, that was his 100th appearance for Tottenham. You know, he is doing what all of us dream of doing. He is a Tottenham fan through and through. His whole family are Spurs fans. He's come through the academy. And last night, he made his 100th appearance for Tottenham Hotspur. It's brilliant for him. It is. Um... 
you know, whatever you think about his long term future, what he's going to do, uh, where he's going to play. Um, you know, don't forget previous managers have all kind of tipped him as a future Tottenham captain as well. Whether that ends up happening, we don't know. But I don't think you can deny kind of how hard he's worked to get to this point. Um, and he had some nice little quotes in an interview after the game with Spurs play. He said, um, it's a proud moment um, getting his 100 uh, appearances. He said, you'd like to get it in a win, of course, but it's something I'm very proud of, especially coming through the academy. It's always a dream to put on that shirt and to play in front of these fans. I'll reflect on it in a few days with immense pride, but today I'm disappointed we didn't get through to the next round because that was the objective for everyone. I always want to keep on improving and keep pushing. I don't take it lightly. That I've managed to play 100 games is a big achievement. It's something I can always look back on, but for me it's just now to keep on improving. We've had a different manager this year. He's been a breath of fresh air for everyone. I think there's a lot of improvement that needs to be done and can be done with this group. It's a young group with a lot of talented players who are playing in the league for the first time and will only get better. We're really disappointed with tonight, but there are promising signs. He speaks very well. He does. I'm very so wary of kind of going like praising Oliver Skip because it sounds awful, but just kind of people, I don't know, there's this weird kind of thing where I feel like some people are actually harder on homegrown players than they are on foreign players. But then there's all, I think there's fans maybe from other countries that feel like, um, especially English people, I guess, are kinder or, or less or more forgiving to English players than they are to foreign players. And actually, I feel like on this side of it, it's almost the other way around. Um, but yeah, I thought he did well. And bear in mind, I thought he played very well um, against Man United as well. So it was a nice little run. And I would be surprised if Postacoglu hasn't seen both of those performances and thought, yeah, you know, you know what, yeah, you go for it. You play against Brentford. You, you, uh, you, you've earned that. Um, we'll see. I could be completely wrong. But um, I think just the fact that he did what Postacoglu wanted from him. And that, that's the bare minimum, really. And if he's going to do that, why not get him in the team? Um, look, of talking of praise, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I, I want to make it very clear. I'm not praising Oliver Skip over a certain Mickey van der Ven, who was amazing yesterday. Um, bear in mind that guy, that was his second start in almost three months. Um he was brilliant. He was Man City's biggest pain in the backside um, last night. He uh, he just was there constantly. Had the back of so many of his teammates. He made um, just a string of tackles. Um, kept kind of uh, bailing out Christian Romero, I guess is the only way to put it. Romero had quite a few moments when he got caught up pitch a bit, um, left a massive space in behind him. But I do wonder whether he does that now, safe in the knowledge of Mickey will be there. Mickey is super fast. Mickey's got my back. And Mickey does. He really does. Um, like I say, string of tackles, one interception, seven clearances, blocked two city shots. Um, <clears throat> his passing was near faultless. We'll talk about the others passing. 96.6% pass success rate from 58 attempts, which is the highest percentage of any of the 22 players that started the game. Um, yes, some of his passes would have been shorter passes, but um, especially when you're at the back and you're being pressed, that's what you want your players to be. Cool under pressure and showing that kind of ability on it. Um Oh, there was one that just remembered on Julian Alvarez. He made a brilliant last ditch block, uh, deflected the ball behind the goal. So, so good. Um, and when I talk about Muskipi and summing up the mentality that Postacoglu wants, so does Van de Ven. Um, fears no one, rises to the occasion. I think, you know, most of the big games he's been particularly good as well. Obviously, Chelsea was unlucky because he got that injury. Um, oh, if he can steer clear of hamstring problems, more of them. He's going to be a star for years to come. What I love about him, I kind of see him as a bit of a blend of Jan Vertonghen and Ledley King. You could do a lot worse than those two players as you blend. Um, I think he's kind of got that uh, panache and style and, and swagger that Vertonghen had, but with Ledley's ability to, that little bit of pace, um, I'd probably say Van der Ven is probably faster than Ledley. Obviously, Ledley's knee was the issue as he went on, uh, but he certainly had pace in his younger years. 
Um, but he's also got Ledley's ability, I think, to wait until the f perfect moment for the tackle, not to dive in, to, if anything, usher them out of the way more than he actually does to dive in. Um, oh, I'm a massive Van der Ven fan. He's so, so good. And uh, and this is going to be the issue for Radu Dragasin now, or Radu Dragasin, I think it is, um, coming in now. Rad Dragasin. Literally, two words. Can't pronounce either of them properly. Radu Dragusin um, is that he's got in Romero a player who, yeah, he didn't start the game great, but he actually got better and better as it wore on. And it was very difficult to get past as it as it wore on. Who also has become a terrific leader. Um, Postecoglou said on Thursday ahead of the game how they really had were missing uh, Sonny's ability just to talk to everyone, just to get everyone g'd up. Just behind the scenes on a normal day in Hotspur way, just just chatting to everyone, asking them how they're doing, keeping everyone connected as a family. And he said he'd noticed Romero in the last couple of weeks has really stepped into that role, he'd become very talkative, very vocal behind the scenes with everyone. Um, and I do wonder whether Radu Dragashin is kind of thinking, oh man, these two, you know, they stay fit, they're, they're set, they are the two kind of, they're such a terrific partnership. But he's a very talented player, only 21. Um, and I think all it needs is a drop in form for either of those two or an injury. And he's in there. And, and he'll be able to have his play for the shirt as well. So while right now he must be thinking, oh man, I do think uh, that competition, I think I'm sure there'll be another centre back joining in the summer as well. I think it's only going to push all of them on. Um, it is. What I would say, there was one moment with Romero in the goal itself. Um, it, to be fair to him, he had been cramping up. Um, it's quite funny. He kind of cramped up after a brilliant tackle on De Bruyne. De Bruyne helped him out, that old classic, I'm going to push your leg down uh, moment. And uh, he was getting applauded for it. It was like, what a guy De Bruyne is. It's very hard to dislike Kevin De Bruyne. He is such an incredible player. I go as far to say... You know, non-Spurs, he is probably my favourite Premier League player by a distance as well. He's so fantastic. I've always said this. I would take him, if, if I could pick any player in the Premier League to come into the Spurs team, it would be him. Um, you know, and that's without, you know, Haaland. Haaland up front in this Postecoglou team would be brilliant. Um, but just for me, De Bruyne is just incredible. Um, so I'm getting all gushy about him as well now. Um, but yeah, after that, Romero, I looked back, I've watched the corner that led to the goal so many times. It was a corner, wasn't it? It wasn't a throw. It was a corner. Um, he's a little bit um, of a bystander for it, Romero. He is kind of just watching on. And obviously, you had that little moment with Ruben Diaz tussling with Vicario before the ball was whacked in. And you kind of wonder... And again, it might have been the system Matty Wells had put in for the defence that he wasn't meant to do that anyway. But you do wonder whether had he got himself in between uh, Vicario and um, Diaz, whether the goal would have even come. Because it kind of would have blocked that all off and stopped that. But he didn't. And that meant that Vicario obviously could only kind of come out and he kind of just weakly knocked the ball down. Hit uh, Van der Ven, who looked... Really like, oh, what's this happening? He was like really surprised by it. And I think that actually didn't help him because he then turned around really like slowly and that allowed Ake just to get a little, the ball was bouncing and touched it in. And look, we're going to talk about that, that moment, Diaz and Vicario. There's two ways to look at this. Um, I understand absolutely the frustrated Spurs fans who have looked at that and thought, well, Diaz is impeding him. Um, Vicario and that's obviously what Vicario thought and there have been goals that have been disallowed in the Premier League this season for similar-ish moments um, I mean he's jumped back into him yes he would he did um, what I would say is I kind of felt like he wasn't jumping back into him to impede him he was jumping back in to try to get the ball and look more cynical types may think, no, he wasn't. He was doing that with that in mind. I just don't think it was a foul. I just don't. I don't. I, I kind of look at it and I just feel there was so little contact. Um, he was just literally was standing almost. Yeah, he went backwards slightly. Um, and I know I can already 
hear the angry people going, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. It was a foul. And I understand that, especially as a Spurs fan, and, you know, myself included, you don't want that to be a goal. You're looking for something to be wrong. What I would say, that happens at the other end of the pitch. We're all furious if that gets ruled out because there was so little contact. And I guess it's this whole thing now about um, how much goalkeepers are protected in certain scenarios. But just for me, it's only so far you can go. If a defender can't jump with a goalkeeper to try and head the ball, we're just getting into this weird space now. And I know it was a goal for the opposition. It's, it's almost heresy to say it. But if that had been two defenders both jumping for that ball and one of them is jumping slightly backwards and so the other one kind of, I don't know, heads it down or heads it up into the air, that's not given as a foul. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't in a million years if it was two defenders, sorry, not two defenders, uh, two outfield players trying to vie for the ball. It just wouldn't. But because it's a goalkeeper, people see it in a little bit of a different way. Um, I just feel that Vicario, and he's been magnificent this season, so I'm not going to... Um, uh, that was almost sounded really dodgy. Um, I'm not, um, you know, being nasty to him or anything. Um, <laughs> but I just feel like he could have been stronger. He didn't get a strong punch to it. Yes, he was under pressure, but he's been under pressure and come out for crosses loads this season. I think... Despite his initial annoyance about it, I think he will have gone away with Rob Birch today and had a look at that goal and thought, yeah, yeah, no, I, I could have done better there. I could have called someone back to help me, um, maybe Romero, but I could have you know, really kind of charged out. And, and yeah, I guess there's the idea nowadays that if he charges out and, and hits the player, he maybe gives away a foul. But if he's punching that ball, that doesn't happen. Um yeah, so didn't, for me, not foul. And the VR referees, Tim Robinson and Jared Gillett, looked at it. Long time, couldn't find enough of a foul to, to overrule the on-pitch decision or, or at least tell them to, to look at it again. So it wasn't clear and obvious. Um, Postacoglu was asked about it afterwards and he said, well, the referees had a good look at it, VAR's had a good look at it, and they've decided otherwise, so we have to accept that. Um, do you know what? If you're going to look for a foul in that moment... Um, again, it would be reaching slightly in my mind. But in the build-up, as the ball's coming in, Nathan Ake actually gives Richarlison a shove. Um, and you could easily say that the shove on Richarlison, which kind of pushes him forward a bit, Richarlison doesn't really react well to that. He doesn't like spin around and stay involved. He almost is like, whoa, what's that? And, and kind of takes a moment. But in that moment, having been pushed, it actually created the space for Ake to then touch the ball home. Have a little look at it back. There's definitely this little push on him. Um, it's, uh, for me, if anything, that's that's probably the more obvious foul. But I get it. I get it. And I'm sure there's going to be many comments under this video, people saying, oh, you must be gold. It was a foul. Um, and yeah, I get it. If you're there in that stadium and, and or watching it on TV, it's your team conceding an 88th minute um, goal that, that dumps you out the FA Cup. Yeah, I get it. I get it, and you're not going to probably see otherwise. I just feel for me, just not enough for a foul, not enough. And like I say, I'd be so angry if Spurs had scored that at the 88th minute at the other end and it got chalked off. Um, I would. So, yeah. Um, oh, and Vicaro played well before that. I really should stress, he'd had a good game. He saved the shot from Phil Foden um, that early on that Oscar Bob, which is an amazing name, um, then tapped into the uh, into the net and was ruled out for offside. He made a good save from Silva, of course. Yeah, the air kick from um, Hoybier. Then he made a really good save from Doku. Had run through. Um, God, the quality on that bench! All the players that just came on are just ridiculous. Um, so yeah, Vakari actually played really well. Just for me, in that moment, just could have done a bit more. And and you know. He saved Spurs so many times. I think that might have even been his first error, if you want to call it an error. I was too late for the quote marks. Um, I think that might have been his first error leading to a goal. Although I don't even know if it's going to be counted as an error leading to a goal. Well, he did have one little spillage yesterday as well, didn't he? Yeah, this one had a shot and it kind of bounced out. I can't remember what happened now, but I feel like I vaguely remember that. Um, the fullbacks. 
didn't, you know, bearing in mind that no fullbacks in the Premier League have spent as much time in the opposition box as Pedro Porro and Destiny Doggy, they were definitely disappointed in going forward. I don't think there's any debate about that. Uh, Porro's, like I say, his delivery wasn't really good enough. Set pieces, crosses, passes, whatever. Uh, Destiny Doggy, he went on a couple of decent runs, but maybe didn't know exactly what to do with it at the end of it. But defending, I thought both of them did quite well. Um, I can't really criticise them much for that. Porro had three tackles, three clearances and blocked. Um, actually, that yeah, was a really good uh, block. Blocked a bomb shot. Um, late in the first half, he turned around and roared at the south stand when he did it. Uh, a doggy, three tackles, one interception, two clearances. Uh, both of them picked up yellow cards, actually, as did Vicario for complaining after the goal. Uh, he was... Showing his venomous side again. Uh, very angry about it. Um, a doggy spoke after the game. He said, um, disappointed for the loss. We obviously wanted to win the game and continue in the FA Cup. After games like this, you just have to move on. We all know they're a good team and today was a tough game. It was difficult, but also for them. And at the end, we just had no luck with a goal, but that's football. I think they prepared for the game very well and how to stop us and it worked for them. The way they pressed was man-to-man -man from the start. Um, they pressed high and it was a little bit difficult to get out. It was a tough game. We're all disappointed because we wanted to continue in the Special Cup and also the fans. This is football though and we just have to move on. I think from the start of the season we're fully focused on the Premier League and we want to continue doing well and we have 17 games now to show our best. Yeah, I suppose we've got no option really to <laughs> look at the uh, Premier League. It's the only competition they've got left. Oh, feels like we're doing this a little bit too regularly nowadays, aren't we? I feel like there's a point around this time each season at the moment where we're going, and eh, now to the Premier League. Um, yeah, like I said, 17 years since the last trophy. So, yeah, that cabinet's going to get that little bit more dust on it uh, for another year or so at least. Um, look, it's not doom and gloom. It's not like it, it previously has been when Spurs haven't had much to fight for in the sorry haven't had anything in the cup competitions to fight for left because we can see this direction we can see where they're going an off night like last night does not deviate from what Postecoglou has been doing in this past six months or so um, yeah it's uh, I mean I'm going to read these quotes these kind of said it all I felt. It's fair to say City have got eight or nine years on us. I hope that people have a little bit of perspective about the team we're trying to be. It doesn't happen in six months. I don't think even City did it in six months. That doesn't mean you shy away from the challenge of it or don't get disappointed by it or don't feel like you could have tackled it in a different way. It's not an excuse, but the reality of it is that they're well down the line in being the team they are and we're still very much in the early stages. You need to use that as your benchmark moving forward. And that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I started the video with a sigh, and it's so disappointing to be out of the Premier League, uh, the FA Cup. But ultimately, in both cups this season, they've gone out on penalties in the Carabao. And uh, in the FA Cup, they've been knocked out by the holders, who are a superb team. I mean, my goodness. You look at those two benches last night. You do wonder, had this game been, and obviously they will play at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium again, uh, a little bit further down the line, but... <sighs> That bench, I mean, you have Madison, a half-fit Madison as probably your game-changing player on the bench for Spurs. The City's bench. <sighs> De Bruyne, Doku, Jack Grealish. I don't even think Jack Grealish came on. They didn't even have to use their £100 million attacking midfielder. Uh, Matthias Nunes was on there as well. And if you want to add in defensive options, Edison, John Stones. I mean, that's what? Three, six players there in alone are probably worth about... 400 million on their own um yeah they are an incredible side man city that they're for me yeah the other teams have kind of been decent in recent years but for me city are just and you can argue about the way they've been put together you can argue about whatever you want to do about city um but they are an incredible squad of players so yeah i'm not going to beat myself up about the fact that spurs have gone out of the fa cup to them just disappointed in the way they went about the game because they're better than that Tottenham. Um, but yeah, it's all about now what comes next. Um, how they bounce back from this. How Postacoglu puts his plans into place for the future. Because that was another little interesting thing on Thursday. 
he was asked, um, some of the journalists were desperately trying to get out of him what he got up to on his little mini break, the four days he gave the players off. And they were like trying to see, like, what shows did you watch? What were you doing? Just any little kind of tidbits about his life. Uh, tidbits, not tidbits, tidbits. <laughs> Sounds a bit weirder. Um, and he just wasn't giving anything away. He wasn't talking about, um, he admitted, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm with my family, I watch TV and listen to podcasts and music and stuff like that. He said, but, you know, he was working. Uh, he still did a lot of work. He said, there is work to do. I kind of use those moments to look a bit further down and see stuff that needs to be done. While the cold face of it is games to prepare for and win, there's some longer-term stuff I'm still keen to build within the club. And you start mapping out those things and see if we can make an impact now or a bit later on when we're going to make an impact. Um, it all helps to get you to where you want. Everyone, Everybody wants to get away, as in on a holiday, I think, for those days. But even if I got away, I would be thinking along those lines. Um, sorry, just some little transfer thing about Everton coming up there. Just of no interest to in this video at all. Um, yeah, so I thought that was really interesting. I think that's heartening to hear him kind of thinking about the future, thinking about longer term stuff. He definitely seems to have been hinting at that sort of stuff in recent weeks. The other day, um, no, maybe two weeks ago, he was talking about, you know, potentially finding a, uh, like settling down and actually buying a house. Because um, they've, I think even in Glasgow, they never really settled and, and actually bought a house. Certainly at the moment, I think they're renting a house in London, the Postacoglu family. They've only just come back. They've, they've been in Australia. Um, so he's kind of been there. Uh, Living life as a, I was going to say like a bachelor. I don't think um, that's exactly the uh, Ange Postacoglu life. It's probably just sitting at home watching lots and lots of football. Um, but yeah, it does feel like he is looking to the future. Um, despite the fact that, yes, there's always this thing with Spurs. When we have nice things, we're not allowed them. People want to take them away. And I've seen this week there's been, you know, links to... Um, uh, and taking over from Pep Guardiola in 2025 when his contract ends, because obviously he's got previous links to the City groups. Um, Yokohama from Maranos were, uh, I think, the City group were a minority shareholder in them, so he has had links with them in the past. Um, and now with Jurgen Klopp leaving as well, there's been links with him with Liverpool. Um, he was actually asked about um, Klopp after the game and he said like, it's not really the right time to talk about it because obviously he was just so flat and downbeat after the defeat. Uh, but he had spoken to ITV before kickoff about him. He spoke really well. He said, I guess I was as surprised as anyone else because he's a top manager and they're flying at the moment. But also understanding at the back of my mind that probably all of us who have been in the game a while, it's the constant thought in your heads because you know how much you need to put into the position. He's probably one of the unique ones. He's an outstanding manager, world class. He will go down as one of the best. But when you do that at one club for so long, that is the uniqueness of it. You have to rebuild teams all the time within the same context. It is totally understandable. My only wish is he does stay out of the game a little while for a couple of reasons. The obvious one about the competitiveness, but it also gives me a bit of hope that when I call it a day, I'm not going to get the urge to come back too quickly. And uh, Guardiola said something similar afterwards about he can now sleep better at night knowing Klopp's going to not be a Premier League manager next season. Um, I didn't see his press conference, um, Klopp, but I think he also said that he wouldn't come back to the Premier League. He probably wouldn't return to Liverpool. Um, I, think, I think he said that, as in, you know, I don't know whether that's because sometimes you come back and you spoil the memories kind of thing. Um and yeah, he'd never manage, manage anyone else in the Premier League. And I think he's going to take at least a year out from football. Um, I saw a, someone say, or a stat or something, that he hasn't been unemployed by any any more than three months since 1990 or 1993, um, in terms of a player or a, or a manager. Um, oh, Madison has just tweeted... <clears throat> Great to be back. Thanks so much for the reception. Meant a lot to me that. Now can't wait to get going. Um, yeah, very nice too. Um, yeah, so look, the post links to Liverpool, they're purely, aren't they? Because, well, obviously he plays a lovely brand of football, which is going to be attractive to any team. 
But I think it's also the fact that he admitted, and he's said publicly, I think it was in his his book that he'd written years back, that he was a Liverpool fan as a kid. Um, you might remember he was asked about that before the uh, Spurs played them back in September. And he said back then, I had a couple of mates who went the United way, so I went with Liverpool to make it interesting. Like any kid, I had the posters up on the wall. Liverpool was my team, but you grow up, things change. I used to love happy days, but I don't have posters of the Fonz on my wall now. That's how it goes, which, of course, Henry Winkler, the Fonz, saw. And then we saw him sending him a signed thing. So some Spurs fans have been a little bit worried about the links. Um, I guess you could look at Postacoglu's career and say, yeah, he hasn't stayed at clubs for too long. Um, kind of a, an average of around two to three years, I'd say, at each club, um, across his clubs, I mean. Mostly, though, I would say that's been him stepping up the football ladder each time to the kind of um, the next rung of... Uh, where his career could go. Um, and also, I think, a feeling that he's probably achieved everything he could at each of those clubs, or even with his country. That was a little bit different. He left Australia for different reasons, um, some issues behind the scenes, but he had won the Asian Cup with them. Um, some might argue, of course, that Liverpool could be the next rung on the ladder or a Man City. Um, I think others would probably point out at Spurs, he's maybe got a chance to create a football club how he wants it, rather than simply being a part of one, which you would be at somewhere like Liverpool. Um, but what I would say, regardless of all of that, from what I understand, Spurs have no fears that he will leave them this summer um, prematurely. Obviously signed a four-year deal when he joined. Um, from everything I kind of understand, talking to people that, that kind of know him, people around him, he's very um, he's excited about the Spurs project and, and what he can do within it and, and what the club can become under him. Um, like I you know, told you the quotes from him there, he's kind of trying to plan the structure and everything he wants put in place for, for the long term. Um, and those who know him say that he is someone who's very loyal to those who give him a chance as well. And he really wants to succeed for them. Um, and that's something that every time in his career someone's given him an opportunity, he has repaid them like tenfold for what they've they've done for him with lots of success. Um, and I think that feels like that's the case at Spurs as well. So like I say, there's no fear within the club that he could suddenly this summer go, no, no, I want to go to Liverpool. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, even last year, he was very heavily linked with Brighton. Um, and... Uh, I think he made it clear, it was this season actually he was, he was talking about that. Someone asked him about those Brighton links and he said, like, I would never have left Celtic halfway through doing the job kind of thing. Um, and obviously he didn't. He then went on and, and it, to be fair, he wasn't saying that, you know, oh, he was definitely he was heading to Brighton or anything. He was a very strong candidate for them. But he was just making it clear that he wouldn't leave a project kind of halfway through. And obviously, yeah, second half of that season, they, they won the domestic treble, which was record-breaking. I think it was the eighth time, which is more than any other club, I think. Um, in total, obviously, five trophies across two years at Celtic. I can understand Celtic fans probably thinking, well, you left us. But I guess he'd already won everything he could within the the domestic game. And I'm sorry to say it, you know, being half Scottish myself through my mum... Um, the Scottish game, of course, is on a lower ladder, a lower rung of the ladder to the Premier League. So it is a big step up in that case, I feel like. Um, yeah. And do you know what? If, if I'm Liverpool as well, I'm probably... Alonso makes the most sense. He does. Xabi Alonso by Leverkusen is doing a brilliant job. They're um, top of the Bundesliga. They're really obviously upsetting the apple cart there with um, Bayern Munich. He's doing terrifically. He's one of the, I say one of their own, not quite, but you know, he's a former Liverpool player. He's only 42 years old. He kind of fits that profile of the next Klopp, I guess, that person who can um, come in for the long term, create a bit of a dynasty again, I guess. Um, obviously, they would have probably hoped that would have been Steven Gerrard. That hasn't really worked out that way because of the, where his career's gone. Um, it does really show you, doesn't it, that. All of these kind of managers who are being groomed to be the next of at their former clubs, they've got to be so careful, you know, with, with what they do. But then it works both ways, I guess. Frank Lampard went quite early on into the Celtic job, uh, Celtic job, Chelsea job. Didn't work for him as Chelsea boss. Whereas Gerrard, 
started well at Rangers, but then kind of all started to go a bit pear-shaped at Villa as that went on and probably did himself out of the Liverpool job. And obviously he's now in the uh, the Saudi Pro League. Um, but with Alonso, yeah, maybe it's, you know, he's had that experience at a decent level with the Bundesliga rather than Lampard was at Derby, wasn't he, before he went there. Um, and I guess also Gerard, I suppose, in the Scottish League. Whereas maybe, you know, being top of the Bundesliga with Leverkusen, if he goes on to win it, you know, he could have claimed that he's kind of completed that. Um, he actually was asked about Liverpool job. It's amazing, wasn't it? Klopp made that kind of uh, announcement, and it just happened to be on a day that there were loads of press conferences, I think, for the weekend games. So he was asked about it, Alonso, and he said, that's a direct question, but I don't have a direct answer to that. I'm trying to give my best to help my players be ready for the next thing. That's my goal. What will come next? I don't know. And I think I saw quotes from the CEO of Leverkusen saying they wouldn't step in his way um, if he wanted to move to a club like that. The reason I'm saying all that is there's another video about Liverpool. It's more saying there's a clearer path for someone else. Uh, so I th I'd imagine that's also part of the lack of fear at Spurs of Postacoglu going. Um, and I think when it comes to Guardiola, he even hinted last night that he might um, extend his contract beyond 2025 at City anyway. So, you know... Postacoglu's here for the now and hopefully for the long term. Um, and this is it as well. Is he hasn't really had, uh, he hasn't got to this level before in his career. And th this could be, he's got everything at his disposal at Tottenham. If he wants to make them a huge club again, like they used to be um, in in the sixties mainly, then he can do that. Um, he's got, you know, he does feel very grateful to Spurs for what they've done. Also. You know, not discounting the incredible work that he's done to get there and the hard work he's put in, but also um, I think there's an understanding of the real potential that they could have under him. You know, like I say, take last night out of it, out of the equation, and we've seen Spurs this season just have, I was almost going to say a bad word there, show no mm, about going anywhere um, and playing any team and playing the Postacoglu way. And he's able to go there and do that with a team that has got far more quality than any team he's ever used before. I'm so excited in these coming weeks to see what uh, Basuma, Madison and Bentacle, let's say, together is like. I mean, that's mouth-watering. You know, Van der Ven and Romero behind them. I do think Basuma within that uh, lineup. suddenly I think I'd be stunned if he doesn't return to form. Um, and then, you know, the attacking options that there are now. And like I said, they're going to have a bench that's going to have game-changing options. He's going to be able to rotate. He's going to be able to not have players getting knackled or hamstring injuries as much because he's going to be able to give them, you know, 60 minutes at a time, let's say, and, and things like that. And I'm very excited about what Postacoglu can do to his team. And moments like last, uh, matches like last night don't take that away from me at all. Um, you know, it is about getting Madison up to speed again. Uh, definitely wasn't ready for yesterday on that evidence. Uh, Postacoglu was asked after the game if it was a close decision for him to start. He said, no, not really. I think knowing the nature of the game today, he's trained well this week and a, and a half, but he missed a lot of football. We were hoping to get him some minutes tonight, which he did, and he should be right to go from now on. But there's another two games next week and we need him and others to pitch in. So, yeah, it wasn't really much of a dilemma about whether to start him or not. It just felt that coming. I just felt that coming off the bench was going to do better for us as a team more than anything else. Um, yeah. So uh, transfer window. Still got a transfer window, of course. It's not even just about that. It could. Who knows? There, there might be further additions. There might be departures. Uh, this is the uh, <laughs> in the NFL red zone. They go. This is the witching hour when wins become losses and losses become wins or something like that, or the other way around. Uh, and this is a little bit like the transfer window's witching hour. This is when, um, you know, players can suddenly disappear from a club that you didn't expect them to leave. And sometimes opportunities open and players arrive at a club that you never saw coming. Um, obviously, all eyes are going to be on what happens with Antonio Nusa. Um, Spurs have been involved in talks with them, um, trying to get a deal done with a loan back for them. We'll have to see how that progresses now um, in the coming days. We'll see whether other clubs come on the scene and feel like... I do worry whether, a bit like the Bayern Munich and uh, Dragushin, that someone waits to see what price Spurs, if they can agree a fee, and then go, ooh, nice, and then like leap in there and try to kind of agree similar. 
Um, you know, like I said before, uh, Noose has got no intention, doesn't want to leave the club right now uh, in January. So this is the perfect deal, really. Send him back there for six months. As I said before, it's, it's around thirty million the potential price tag. That's what uh, Club Rouge are looking for for the eighteen-year-old. Uh, if you haven't watched previous videos, uh, a winger who predominantly has played on the left this season, but can play across the front line. He is um, uh, broken onto the international scene big time this season. Only four games for Norway, but he's got four assists and one goal in those four games. Um, hasn't been an incredible season for him um, in terms of the Belgian league, but he is he's had an adu uh, was it an adductor injury or a back injury? I can't remember. I think it was a back injury. I'm mixing him up with Timo Werner. Uh, but he's certainly been injured and, and has missed some of this season, which kind of interrupted his, his his campaign a little bit. But yeah, seen as an incredible talent. I've spoken to quite a few agents in the game who kind of all wish that they represent him, I think, um, who feel like he's going to be incredible. He's been compared to Neymar um, by... I can't remember who did that. Someone recently. Um, and I just wonder whether Spurs just think, like, let's push this through. Let's try and push this through because of that competition. Let's get him in, tell him we can go back, get him prepared for the move. Um, and then he comes in, you know, hopefully in the summer. Who knows? Maybe we'd need another year's loan. I would be surprised if for that sort of money you do that. Um, but certainly is, is very exciting. Again, another fast player, especially with the ball at his feet, very fast dribbler. Um, Ronnie Delia, uh, or Dela, the uh, former Celtic boss, who's the manager at Bruges right now, he was asked about him. Uh, the Belgian media outlet reported, he said this week, and he was actually asked about the Spurs' interest, and he said it could be a good option for him. You shouldn't forget that we are working on our season here. I don't think he'll leave now. He wants to stay, and we want that too. He's an important player. There is, of course, a lot of interest. If it doesn't happen now, it will happen this summer. Uh, the most important thing is that he stays focused and wants to get better. I think he's handling it well because he's still young. Now a decision has to be made and he has to do the best he can for us. I hope and think we'll keep him until June and then he will be even more ready to go. So definitely they're looking, you know, he, he seems to be talking about a move for someone um, to... Uh, to take him in the summer and perhaps do the deal now. And hopefully that will be Tottenham Hotspur. We'll see. This is kind of this crunch period now, isn't it? Is whether Spurs accelerate the talks, whether they're waiting to see, um, whether Club Rouge kind of stick to a higher figure, whether they can knock them down a little bit or not. Um, I guess the amount of interest who comes in for the player does dictate that as well. Um, there's been so many situations in the past where Spurs haven't had any real opposition to signing a player so they have let it go a little while until the end to get the best possible deal. It's worked out for them at times. It hasn't worked out for them, definitely in others. Um, God, Jack Grealish being the biggest one, of course. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens with him in the days ahead. Who knows? The way the uh, transfer window works, um, there might be an update as I literally press stop on this video and then while I'm uploading, because it takes a good hour, hour and a half to properly upload. Um, who knows, even in that time something could happen. Um, but they've also been looking at young players across the leagues. Um, Juventus is um, Samuel Eiling Jr. I've mentioned before. He's one they've looked at. Islington-born, playing for Juventus, doing very well. Uh, in the Championship, there's a load of players that they've certainly scouted and looked at this season. They've looked at Jonathan Rowe at Norwich. They've looked at Hayden Hackney at Middlesbrough. Uh, Adam Wharton at Blackburn, who I think Palace are very interested in as well. It's not to say they will uh, build on this interest or act on this interest in these players, but uh, certainly there's various players they've looked at. Because um, obviously, I would imagine in the summer they're going to have to probably bring in a few homegrown numbers as well, homegrown uh, players. Uh, that kind of leads me nicely, I guess, onto Conor Gallagher situation. Um, yeah. Kind of Gallagher situation that's going to have been rumbling on for so long. Spurs are going to keep an eye out, see if there's any late opportunity to sign him in the window. Right now, it's looking unlikely. Um, I mean, let's be honest. 23 year old, he's, he's captaining Chelsea in every game at the moment. He's playing almost every minute in every game for Chelsea right now. He wants to stay at Chelsea. Richo Pochettino wants him to stay at Chelsea and sees him as a key part of the future at Chelsea. 
But yet there's just still this suggestion that because of the financial fair play stuff, that Chelsea would accept the right price for him. I would stress that right price sounds like it's very high. Um, it doesn't sound like the kind of value deal that Spurs would probably normally go for, especially as the fact that he's only got 18 months left in his contract. There has been talk about that he's maybe had some discussions over a contract of some kind, uh, whether that's the case or not. Um, but yeah, I think something would have to significantly change in the next couple of days for uh, Conor Gallagher to kind of end up coming anywhere near Tottenham Hotspur um, in all kind of size. Because also, I said it before, but the Hoybier situation, I feel, is linked to it. Um, they would need him to go somewhere else as well. But... I don't know if any of the interested clubs could maybe pay the fee or at least do a permanent deal that they're looking for. I think if Spurs were to loan Hoybier out, it would be with an obligation to buy they'd want rather than just an option to buy. Otherwise, they're just putting it off until the summer. It's of no real use to them. Um, the Italian media keep linking as a Gallagher alternative, Edison, uh, not the City goalkeeper, but the Atalanta midfielder. That one doesn't really make masses of sense to me in terms of he's more a defensive midfielder. He has scored a fair few. I think he's got six goals this season um, for Atalanta in 28 matches. But definitely more of a defensive player. Um, more naturally. He's quite it's quite uh, versatile. He can play um, a bit like Pat Matisar. He can kind of play a defensive league and play centrally or he can play in an attacking role. But he is seen as more of a defensive midfielder, the Brazilian um, so I don't know, we'll see whether that ends up being kind of agent talk, Italian media talk or whether it ends up being something more to that but it, yeah, that would be a bit of a, a stranger one for me especially with the, num the amount of number sixes they've really got at Spurs <clears throat> um, Postal Coglu was asked about further business on Thursday ahead of the game and whether it would be any more and you just kind of get this sense that well he spoke about it, how happy he is that the priority signings of Dragashin and Werner have been done they're the ones I think he really wanted this window. And he said, as for what happens with the rest of it going forward, we're always alert and doing work. And if we can approve the squad, we'll look to do that. And if there are potentially any outgoings, we're ready for that, depending on what happens. I think we're in a decent place with the anxiety going into it and thinking where we did where where did we really need to help the squad, especially in this period, I think we're in a good place now. Um Yeah, it's true. I mean, potential outgoings. I mean, you're probably looking at Brian Hill. Brian Hill, I guess, is is one of them. Um, I mean, he's become... I mean, even yesterday, Dane Scarlett came off that bench before he did. Um, it, he's just... I just don't get the impression. And this is just my thoughts. This isn't saying this is the case. But I don't get the impression that Postacoglu sees him as a game-changer sees him as a as a player who will you know make the difference for them um for Tottenham in any given moment which yeah it, it's not great for for Hill it's not uh especially when you look at the amount of like I said earlier when you've got Sonny coming back and Madison coming back is going to push uh Kusevsky into being a forward option again on the left hand side you've got you'd probably say in this order of hierarchy Sonny Werner Hill on the right-hand side, you've got... And actually, Mana Solomon as well. Um, there's a lot on the left-hand side. And on the right, you've got Kulusevsky, Johnson, um, Solomon and Hill as well can play on the right. Um, so, yeah, I do think you've probably, when everyone's fit, almost I can't see how Brian Hill gets game time. Um, he wants to stay at the club. He wants to fight for his place. But... Is he going to really have the opportunity to do so? And that, that just makes me think that he might be someone that heads off. I think Spurs would probably want to sell him at this point rather than yet another loan move for him. Whether that's a viable thing, I don't know. Um, whether it ends up having to be a loan with, a, with an option again. Although, has he, I don't think he's had an option, actually, in any of the previous ones. It might be the first time. Um, and it is a shame. I like Brian Hill, but I just don't see that... Postacoglu sees him as the long-term future, which is which is a shame. But uh, and then you got Sess, Ryan Sessegnon. I think with Ben Davies really healing quickly, that's um, that's made a big difference. I think 
in how Cess and a lone move or a move out of the club would be seen. Obviously, um, I asked him about him on. I said, obviously, I'm so sorry. I hope I haven't done as many obviously in this video. Some people were saying that to me at the um, the Q and A on Wednesday night about my uh, fear of saying that word. Um, I asked um, Postacoglu about um, Cess and where he is fitness wise, and he said he hoped to be back involved in training this coming week with them. Um, he said it was just a consequence of coming back to action after 11 months without playing a game and just the natural kind of issues that they'll have with his body and they're going to have to be very careful with him. So I do wonder whether they just see that as, should we get him out somewhere where he can get more game time or do we have to monitor him carefully here? I would imagine if they did get a decent offer for him, they're now in a position where they were in the summer. In the summer, they were willing to let him go, Cess. Um, and I think, personnel-wise, you're back in that scenario where you probably can let him go. So keep an eye maybe on Cess in the next couple of days. And what happens with him, other than that, you're going to probably, it's like I said before, it's the, it's the under-21s, the academy players, the likes of Junison, Sutt Bell, under-21s, and maybe 11 wins in a row in Premier League 2 today. Was Will Lancashire was on fire. He scored so many goals. I do wonder if it's an either-or if we get a loan offerer comes in for either Sunset Bell or Lancashire. I think Sunset Bell probably needs it more right now um, as a 20-year-old, I think he is. Uh, Lancashire's only 18, so he's got plenty more time and, and obviously doing fantastic things for the under-21s. Jamie Donnelly, if you weren't aware, he wasn't um, in the Spurs squad yesterday. Santiago was on the bench, Diogo Santiago. He obviously also was. Oh, I said obviously again. He wasn't in the under twenty ones yesterday, uh, today even, um, and that's because he's had a little hamstring issue. Um, but he should be back in contention uh, this week. If if not for the Everton, uh, sorry, if not for the Brentford game, then for the Everton game to be part of the squad. Um, yeah, and then you've also got players coming back for the international break. Um, international break. The international uh, competitions. This this month <coughs> um when it comes to them i didn't even realize until i can't remember it might have been george from pa mentioned it but then i started to look into it they're going to get at least one of them back for the brighton game i didn't realize that at all and the reason behind that is because if they both win their round of 16 games um marley and senegal will play each other in the quarterfinal which means you're either going to get basuma or Saar back so just to kind of keep you aware if you're not uh, up to speed on how they're all doing in their respective competitions. Sunny at the Asian Cup. South Korea take on Saudi Arabia on Tuesday in the round of 16. Saudi Arabia have done very well in the competition, so I think they may have won all of their group games, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's his round of 16 game. Uh, Saar and Senegal face Ivory Coast, the hosts in the Africa Cup of um, Nations on Monday. Basuma and Mali in action against Burkina Faso on Tuesday. Um, and then, like I say, if they were to win both of those games, their countries, Saar and Basuma would take on each other in the quarterfinals on February the 3rd, which is the same day as Spurs go to Everton. Um, yeah, so, which would mean that, at, on paper, you'd imagine Senegal, the current holders of the Africa Cup of Nations, um better they've won all three of their group stage matches Mali um one win and two draws to get through you'd imagine they're the favorite Senegal if they were to get they've both obviously got to win their round of 16 games first um but yeah if you could get you know Basuma or Saar back for the Brighton game on the 10th that would be the next game after that that would be fantastic but who knows you know South Korea aren't flying right now they're stuttering a bit under Jurgen Klinsmann um, like I say, Saudi Arabia doing well in this Asian Cup. You never know which way that game is going to go. Um, obviously, wish the best for, for South Korea. I've got a, a bit of a connection with South Korea. That's purely because they had such a marvellous time there when I went there in um, a couple of years ago. And the people were so lovely. Um, but uh, I do wish them the best. But obviously, Spurs fans will be a little bit selfish, I guess, and want uh, Sonny back as the captain and uh, a world-class player back in their team. So we'll see what the next few days brings. But like I say, you're guaranteed to have at least one of those three back for um, the February 10th game against Brighton. 
Um, oh, it's uh, it's Brentford and Brighton close together, isn't it? I'm going to do the whole Brightford thing again if I haven't already said it. Oh, I was so tired that day. Was that no? That was that was when I was ill as well, wasn't it? I forgot about old Brightford. Um, yeah, and also looking at the fixtures coming up, Spurs because of the Chelsea game is going to be moved because of the Carabao Cup final and Chelsea being in it. Spurs four of their next five games are at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, so it's a great chance to really put some momentum together. I mean. If you want to count last night, it's five and six. So it's a it's a good opportunity to to get something going. Brentford up next. Obviously got Ivan Tony back and uh, moving balls before he hits free kicks. Um, but like I say, I would hope Spurs will go flying into this match. Um, should have you would have thought Madison by that point. Another five days or so would be able to then start. Uh, Skippy was talking about the next game and what comes next afterwards he said we know we can't feel too f sorry for ourselves we play again on Wednesday night against Brentford we've just got the league to focus on now we've got to make sure that we put everything into that and put in a performance that's more like us I would say we respect every team in this league and especially a team like Brentford their record against the big teams has always been really good so we've got to be aware of their threats but also be aware that when we get it right how good we can be We'll focus on ourselves. They've got Ivan Tony back, so that's a big threat for us. But I'm sure if we train hard this coming week, we'll get back to the levels that we want to. Um, yeah, yeah. Postacoglu will want a reaction, absolutely. Um, especially, like I say, with this uh, run of home games, or four out of five uh, home games, um, there's a chance to really build some momentum. There is. Um, there's only one prize on offer now. Um Let's be honest, eight points behind Liverpool. It's probably not going to be a Premier League title, but only three points behind City in second. Who knows how far, how high Spurs could finish this season. So um, I think everything now, they've just got to pour every fibre of their beings into being the best version of a Postacoglu Tottenham they can. And if they can get anywhere close to that, they're going to do very well and finish high this season. And yes, as much as we want to still be in the Cups, there is, of course, the aspect of the less games means more recovery time, more work on the training pitches, and Spurs should be fitter and more focused and prepared for each game. Um, didn't wasn't the case entirely for last night, but the idea is that it should work like that. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. So, yeah, big games to come ahead. Um, crikey, what happened there? Someone, the referee chased off a pitch. No way. Port Vale game. Wowzers. I think the referee was chased off a pitch. I didn't see that. My goodness. That's, uh, that is dodgy. Oof. Scary, isn't it, that people get on the pitch and nothing happened that. Um, oh, there it is. Referee Craig Hicks chased off Port Vale and Portsmouth match. Wow. That is ridiculous. Um, wow. Um, I was just trying to think there. I'm trying to think of there. I saw any performances of lone players. Ashley Phillips and Joe Roden came up against each other in the FA Cup today because Leeds were playing Plymouth. It was 1 1. Um, so that goes to a replay. Alfie Devine couldn't play because he'd already played for Port Vale in a previous round. I'm trying to think if I saw anything else. Um, Antonio Nusa was set to play. I know it's not a lone round up. That sounds like I'm saying that he's part of the club. It's just I remember looking as I was writing a piece earlier that technically he is um, set to play tonight. Um, let's see if the teams are... are the, he is... He's on the bench. He's on the bench. But to be fair, he kind of has been in and out of the team this season because he's so young. They, uh, they hasn't been starting many of the games. And like I say, he's very raw. He's a work in progress, but he's got incredible potential. So yeah, he's in the squad. Just in case anyone got all overexcited and thought he wasn't uh, wasn't part of it. Um, I don't think I saw any other loan play. I'll do a proper loan roundup um, in the week or some point. So keep an eye on my Twitter account. Um, but yeah, that's it in terms of Spurs. A little briefly on the the Q and A, I did. I did say I'd have a little word about it. It was it was great fun. It was for the supporters trust. It was members um, of the supporters trust. 
paid a very small amount. It was all for charity. It was um, obviously the, the trust have had a, a couple of long standing members of the past who died in the last year or so, including Pete Hain, who I knew well. He was just the loveliest guy, most wonderful guy. Um, would come up to me at half time uh, at the under 21s. We'd chat throughout half time. Sometimes come up to me at the Tottenham Hospital Stadium when he saw me there as well. Just the kindest, loveliest man. Um, such an awful loss because he was so brilliant. Um, and yeah, so this was a charity event um, to raise some funds for their charities. I think it was pancreatic cancer. And uh, it was myself, Charlie, Charlie Eccleshare from The Athletic, Dan Kirkpatrick from Evening Standard and Michael Bridge from Sky Sports. It was good fun. There was some... Uh, it was in a in a pub in London. I think we had in all about 120, 130 people came along. It was sold out for, for the little kind of the room area that they had. Uh, we had some tricky questions, had some fun questions. Worst managers, best managers. What's the food like at the stadium? Um, yeah, good stuff. I was sat next to Bridgie, uh, Sky Sports, Michael Bridge. We had a microphone uh, in between each pair of us. So Dan and Charlie shared a, uh, like a microphone it wasn't one you'd hold it was like a, a desktop microphone i had bridgie all i'd say never sit next to someone whose career is about talking to a microphone um <laughs> for their day job i was having to wrestle the mic away from him at times genuinely in the second half of it was slapping his hand away so stop interrupting everyone um he was he was really enjoying himself he was having a good fun but we all had good fun it was a lovely event um and yeah and actually i got this really cool poster um Lots of people came up in the interval and after it and had a really long like, chats about stuff and people that watch these videos and, and you know who you are. Thank you so much. It was, it was honestly some really lovely chats. Um, and there was one very kind chap who comes up who runs a Spurs artwork website, which I think does T-shirts and posters called Footballista. I'm so sorry. I can't, I can't remember your name. A lovely chap who came over and he gave me this as like a little gift. And I thought as soon as I got it, I thought I would show this on camera. It's so cool. Look at that. Because he knows, he said, he knows I love movies and I love Spurs. Um, so, yeah. Oh, actually, is that shown, shown back to front on there, isn't it, in the camera? Oh, apologies for that. Essentially, yeah, it's a Klinsman one, Wonderland. Um, yeah, very, very, very cool. Um, and it, I've had a little look at the website. There's loads like that on there uh, for various players. Um yeah, it's very cool. It's, it's not me advertising anything. It was just a very, very nice gift. And I've, I was quite touched by that. So I thought I'd just show it on camera. Um, yeah, yeah. People were, were very, very pleasant. Um, they were really, very nice. So, uh, yeah, that's it, really. I think we'll probably talk about everything we can maybe talk about in this. Uh, like I say, the transfer window will now unfold in its final days. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have time to do another video before the transfer window ends. We'll see. Maybe maybe try and do like a short video at some point if there's any spot time. But the problem I've got this week, we've got a Tuesday press conference. We're straight back in it. Wednesday, um, obviously the match against Brentford. Um, so there's not really a lot of time. I'm probably not going to be able to do a video until maybe the day after the transfer window closes because I've just got loads to do. But we'll see. We'll see how it all shapes up and what happens. If Spurs could act a little bit earlier in the week, that'd be fantastic. I could maybe do that, but uh, knowing Spurs, we'll probably leave it till deadline day. That's that's the way they, they operate. But uh, yeah, there'll be plenty more for us to talk about regardless. So uh, yeah, I'm going to head off now, as always. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And yeah, as I say, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye. <laughs>